Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston, Executive Recruiter, Director of Recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And for those of you watching today, I hope you've noticed my shirt, because yes, indeed, Today on the show, I'd like to welcome Hal Elrod, author of the best-selling book, The Miracle Morning, and host of the Achieve Your Goal podcast. After surviving multiple near-death experiences and impacting millions of people through his books and speeches, he's now leading a worldwide movement to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. I am so excited that Hal is here with us today, and I want to give a quick shout out to Larry Roberts and Eric Cabral for making this happen today. Hal, I know our time is limited with you today, so I want to go ahead and get right to our questions so we can get as much information out of you as possible. So Hal, your Miracle Morning philosophy has helped so many people make profound changes in their lives. For those who don't know your story, can you share a little bit about the experience that brought you to adopt this philosophy? Yeah, it was unexpected. You know, it was never a book idea or anything along those lines. Um, it was in, so in, in uh, 1999, I was in a car accident. I was hit head on by a drunk driver at 80 miles an hour and I was found dead at the scene. My heart stopped for six minutes. I was in a coma for six days and I woke from the coma to face this unimaginable reality and be told I would never walk again. So that sent me on a path in my life to try to really find purpose and meaning in the midst of adversity, if you will. And then fast forward eight years later, when the U.S. economy crashed in 2008, um, I had learned to walk again. I was in, you know, I was, I had just actually finished a, a Hall of Fame uh, sales career with Cutco Cutlery, and I was a coach. That's how I made my money was as a coach, and I was writing it for my first book, and. Um, the, when the U.S. economy crashed, I kind of crashed with it. I lost over half of my clients. I couldn't pay the mortgage. My house was taken by the bank. My credit card went from uh, paid off every month to living on it and, you know, and accumulated $50,000 in credit card debt in six months. And I really felt scared and hopeless, and I didn't know how to do – I couldn't figure out how to turn my life around. And I, uh, a series of events led me to a quote. I heard a quote from Jim Rohn. And this quote gave birth to the miracle morning. Jim Rohn said, your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person that you become. And in that moment, I, I rewound my iPod, which I was like this close to selling for food, by the way. I rewound it and I listened to that again. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person that you become. And in that moment, I had an epiphany and I went, well, wait a minute. If we're measuring success on a scale of one to 10 in every area of our life, everybody wants level 10, right? I want level 10 happiness, level 10 health, level 10 relationships. I want level 10 energy. Like in every area of our life, we wanna be a level 10. It's one thing human beings share in common is this innate drive and desire to fulfill our potential. But when I then ask myself, okay, well, if my level of success isn't going to exceed my level of personal development, what's my level of personal development on a scale of one to 10? And I believe this is the disconnect for most people is we all want level 10 success. But when I was honest, I go, I'm like at a two or a three on a good day, you know? And when I say level of personal de development, I define that as who we are and who we're becoming as a person, like our, the knowledge that we possess the discipline that we've developed, the habits that we've implemented into our life, right? That's who we are, how we show up every day. And at that time in my life, I was depressed. I was scared. I was losing money. I was really in a scarcity mindset. So on a scale of one to 10, I was at like a two or three or four. And the epiphany I had was I've got to create the most effective personal development ritual in the history of humanity um, so that I can become gradually day by day, become a better version of myself so that I can become a level 10 person who is capable and qualified 
of creating and sustaining that level 10 success that we all want. And so I went home and I Googled, what are the best personal development practices of all time? And I was looking for one, maybe two that I could do. And I had a list of six meditation, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, journaling. And I was overwhelmed. I go, well, which one is the best? Which one's the most effective? And I kept reading articles and none was apparent. It just depended on who you asked. And I almost kind of threw in the towel with overwhelm. And then I went, wait a minute, what if I did all of these? What if I woke up tomorrow morning an hour earlier and I did all six of the most proven effective personal development practices that the world's most successful people in history have done for centuries. And I thought that would be the ultimate personal development ritual. I woke up the next morning, even though I wasn't a morning person, I was actually excited and I actually learned something that morning that whatever we, our last thought before we go to bed is usually the first thought we have when we wake up. If you go to bed stressed out or worried about your to-do list or whatever, you wake up feeling stressed, feeling overwhelmed, resisting getting out of bed. But I don't know about you, when I was a kid on Christmas Eve, did you celebrate Christmas growing up? We did, and I never slept on Christmas Eve, just FYI. Yeah, yeah, and, but, but, did, but you still woke up with a ton of energy and clarity and oh, yeah. motivation, right? <laughs> because the last thought you had before you went to bed, whether you slept or not, was I'm excited to wake up. And that morning, even though for the last six months I had been depressed and I had been stressed and worried and in fear mode, that night I went, I can't wait to wake up and try this. This is gonna be amazing. I'm gonna do the six most timeless proven practices. I woke up the next morning, I jumped out of bed, I went in the living room and I went through 10 minutes of each, 10 minutes of silence or meditation, um, 10 minutes of affirmations. And by the way, I sucked at all of these cases. Like I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to affirmation, do affirmations. I don't know how to visualize, but even doing a, a very mediocre job of this morning ritual, I felt so much for the first time in six months, I felt clarity. I felt motivation. I had energy. I was compelled and, and optimistic that if I do this every day, it's only a matter of time before I become that level 10 person that I need to be to create the success I want and to kind of tie a bow on the story. I was thinking it would be six to 12 months of this daily improvement. It was less than two months that I more than doubled my income in a declining economy. The economy continued to get worse and worse and worse, but as I got better, my results got better. Um, I went from being in the worst shape of my life physically, having not exercised in six months, to committing to run a 52 mile ultra marathon. I had never run before, and I decided I wanted to challenge myself physically and do something that was so far out of my comfort zone. I, I didn't even feel like it was possible, but I wanted to, I committed. And my depression went in really the first day because I felt so hopeful and optimistic. I wasn't depressed, I was excited. And I went to my wife and I said, sweetheart, I just signed two clients on today. We officially have doubled our income from six months ago. And this is the most I've ever earned in my life. And the economy is a mess. I said, it's this morning routine. It feels like a miracle. And she goes, it's your miracle morning. And I, got, I smiled and I, I go, <laughs> Yeah, I go, I like that miracle morning. That's fun. And so every day in my schedule, I'd write miracle morning, but it wasn't a book idea. It was just my morning routine. And then I decided I taught it to all of my coaching clients. Every single one of them implemented except for one. It was 13 out of 14 clients. Uh, one was stubborn. He's like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. The other 13 came back to their next call two weeks later and said, Hal, I wasn't a morning person two weeks ago. I can officially say I am a morning person. I am never woken up with so much energy and motivation. I don't have the snooze button anymore. And they said, I'm getting the best results in my career, in my fitness, in every area of my life. And that's when the, the real light bulb moment of, if the miracle morning changed my life, and I wasn't a morning person, if it changed the lives of all of my coaching clients, except one, and none of them were morning people, except for, there was a couple, I guess, but most weren't. I thought this could change the world. This could change anyone's life. So I started writing a book. I'm not a real fast writer. It took me three years. Yeah, there's a picture, there's the book. <laughs> um, three years later, I self-published The Miracle Morning with no, I didn't have an audience. I wasn't, a, nobody knew who I was, but I worked my butt off. I was committed to do whatever it took to sell a million copies. And it took six years 
six years we surpassed a million copies and then it's like i think we're at two and a half million copies now a couple of years later and um the the best part about it is the the results from people out of this chain and you're one of them right but this changes people's lives just like it changed mine and so my mission has only grown from a million to a billion and now i'm just i'm doing everything in my power to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time and one person at a time and i'm because of that i'm so grateful uh for this opportunity to share this with your audience and it's so amazing and it's such the ripple effect right and it's I, i'm sure you have an idea but like i'm on i'm on the ground i'm on the battleground with these people right and i'm just like i hear all these wonderful stories and i just wanted to share a quick one that came this morning was one of my friends we actually went to coaching school together and um yeah. her son is in prison and she shared the book with him and she said since she and she this morning just this morning she said since she shared this book with him his attitude has changed drastically and not only has his wow. attitude changed he's sharing it with the other inmates wow so wow that's yeah. incredible thank you so much for sharing that yeah and that's for karen gray you so i mean and she was very vulnerable when she shared that information and she wanted you to have that yeah. information Tell her that means so much. I'm so grateful for her and for her son. Uh, and we have had m multiple people before say to do the miracle morning for for inmates or for some, you know, so, so, I don't know what we'd call it, but um, but for that exact reason. So hearing that um, is uh, is yeah, that that's that's really encouraging. It's amazing. So for those of um, the audience, which they should be aware of this, but just in case, kind of walk us through each of the savers, the six practices that make up the miracle morning. Yeah. Yeah, so the first is silence. And it, originally it was meditation, but when I was creating an acronym, which my wife, that was her idea, um, she said, why don't you get a thesaurus and see if you can find words that replace some of the words and organize them into an acronym so people can remember it really easily. Mm -hmm. And I go, she's like my muse, she's so brilliant. And so meditation became silence. And I'm so glad that it did because there's more for, than one form of silence. You can meditate in the morning, Right, or you, you might it might be prayer in the morning. For me, it's a, it's both. I it's I meditate and then I pray. Um, another form is contemplation. You know, just sitting there and asking yourself like a question: What do I need to focus on most in my life right now, or what do I need to focus on improving? Right, and you just sit there, set a time for ten minutes or longer, and just sit. And it's amazing. You think about it. When do our best ideas, our life changing breakthroughs, come? They come in moments of silence. It's at night when we're falling asleep. And as we're falling asleep, we, we have those ideas that we have to wake up, turn the light on and write them in our journal because it's like, oh yeah. my gosh, that's what I need to do to change my relationship, my marriage, my, you know, my, my relationship with my kids. I mean, my, my finances, like we have those ideas. It's in the shower. It's in, right when, when we're in silence, it's in the shower. It's when we're on a walk and there's just nature and we're not listening to any music or anything. We have these brilliant ideas. And, but most of us are overstimulated. We wake up, we go straight to you know, TV or the news or our smartphone, social media, email, whatever. And that's whether it's visual noise or auditory noise, it's noise. And you're not going to have that the brilliant ideas. Um, it's also when, you know, from a spiritual sense, someone might say that's when you can, you know, talk to God, right? Pray, like get that, that connect with infinite intelligence, right? There's a lot of elements of it. So starting your day with a period of peaceful, purposeful silence is really key. Um, and personally, uh, I like to like that I meditate for five minutes and then I usually pray for five minutes or, you know, and I, and I mix it up. It's not, it doesn't have to be rigid. The A in uh, savers is for affirmations and affirmations are in my opinion and my experience, the most misunderstood, mistaught yet most effective form of personal development when done correctly, uh, effectively. So here's the problem with affirmations. There's one of two problems in the way that we've been taught for, I don't know, decades, centuries, I'm not sure how long, I haven't been around that long, but um, in the 40 years I've been around. So the, the first problem is we're taught to lie to ourselves. Um, we're taught to trick ourselves into believing something. So for example, if you're struggling financially and you want to be rich or wealthy, right? We're taught to say, just, just say I am, and then whatever mm -hmm. word follows it is the most powerful, right? I am wealthy, I am a millionaire. I am the problem is the truth will always prevail. And so if your bank account is negative and you say, I am a millionaire, right? Your subconscious is going to go, no, you're not, you know, right? You're, you're going to know that you're trying to trick you. You're smart, right? We're all smart. We know 
So that's not the optimum strategy. The truth will always prevail. And now you're creating an internal conflict if you say something as if it were true now, if it is not yet true. The second problem with affirmations that we're taught is to use this flowery passive language that promises us a magical result uh, without necessarily any effort. And it makes us feel better in the moment. So for example, we, we can stick with the same, the financial track. Let's say you want to improve your finances. There's a really popular money affirmation where you say, I am a money magnet. Money flows to me effortlessly and in abundance. Now that might make you feel good if your bank account is negative or if you're struggling and then you go, oh, thank God I'm a money magnet and money's magically gonna flow into my life. That feels so much better than my reality right now. I'm just going to sit in that delusion for a little bit because I feel safe there, right? But the problem is that deludes you. It doesn't actually get you into action to do the things that will change your financial situation. I'm not about, it's great to feel better, but I don't want to just feel better by deluding myself into saying I'm something I'm not or something is coming my way <clears throat> independent of my effort. I want to affirm things rooted in truth that are practical, that are actionable, and that will produce tangible, measurable results. Here's three steps to do that with affirmation. So here's my miracle morning affirmation formula, if you will. Step one, affirm what you're committed to, right? In life, we don't get what we want unless we are committed to generating that outcome. So my template for my that step one of the affirmations and what you can write this down. I am committed to blank, no matter what, there is no other option. That blank is your ideal outcome. I am committed to blank, no matter what, there's no other option. Um, by the way, you don't need to know yet how you're going to make that outcome mm -hmm. a reality. That often prevents us from even thinking bigger than our current reality. I don't know how I'd make that. I don't know how I'd double my income. I don't know how I'd lose the weight. I've tried before, I've failed, it doesn't work. I don't know how to transform my marriage. We're about to get divorced. I don't even think there, I'm feeling like there's no hope left. If that's your attitude, that's, we create our own reality in that way. So you have to affirm whatever your ideal outcome is, commit to that. Then, and there's a great quote I learned from a mentor when I was like 20 years old. He said, when you commit, the how reveals itself. Mm. H-O-W, when you commit to something, to that outcome, the how reveals itself but not until you go, I'm committed to find a way. And then guess what? You're resourceful, you'll find a way. So number one, I'm committed to blank, no matter what, there's another option. Number two, affirm why you're committed. Why is it a must for you? Why is it meaningful? Why are you willing to do whatever it takes? Because that commitment is so valuable. Write down what the what, your why. And by the way, your why can be more than one why. It, you can have like, these are the three reasons that I am so willing to do this thing. Um, in fact, here's an example. When I had cancer, so three and a half years ago, actually, I think it was four years ago now, I was diagnosed with a very rare aggressive form of leukemia. And I was given a 20 to 30% chance of surviving. So if my car accident wasn't enough, um, then this cancer comes. And, you know, I, I'm a dad. Uh, at the time, my daughter was seven and my son was four. And being given a 20 to 30% survival rate, my cancer, by the way, is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, it's terrifying, right? It's like, you know, you're, you're, I'm essentially being told by the doctors, there's a 70 to 80% chance you're going to die in the next few weeks or months and leave your seven-year-old daughter and your four-year-old son without a dad and your wife without a husband. And that's probably my worst, you know, scenario to leave my kids without me. And um, my affirmation, because I had fear, of course, there was fear but I overrode the fear with faith and I generated the faith with this affirmation. I said, I am committed It's following the formula that I just taught. And we still have step three, but we'll get to that. Step one, affirming what you're committed to. I said, I'm committed to beating cancer and living to be a hundred plus years old alongside Ursula, Sophie and Halston, my wife and kids, uh, Ursula, Sophie and Halston, no matter what, there's no other option. And I affirm that with such conviction. I am committed. Whenever I felt fear, I didn't go down the rabbit hole. I didn't dwell on fear for a day. I wouldn't go more than a minute without pulling out my affirmations and going, no, fear, you are not serving me. Thank you for paying a visit. Like, get out of here. I'm going to replace you with faith. I'm going to decide whether or not I die or live, not my fear. 
And so I affirmed, I'm committed to beating cancer no matter what, there's no other option. And then my, I went into step two, which is the why. And I had five or six whys. I'm committed to beating cancer for my wife, Ursula, for Ursula, because I promised her forever in a day. I'm committed to being cancer for Sophie and Halston because I promise, because they desperately, they need my love, leadership, and guidance. I am committed to beating cancer for my mom because she doesn't deserve to lose another child. I'm committed to beating cancer for my dad because he gave up everything to save me. I am committed to beating cancer for myself because I deserve to live a long, healthy life. And I am committed to beating cancer for the millions of people who are themselves battling cancer or some other disease and we're not blessed with the resources or the knowledge that I was and desperately need my love, my leadership and my guidance in their lives. And that step two, those five or six whys, that's what gave me the energy and the drive and the motivation to follow through with my commitment to beat cancer. I was willing to do whatever it takes. And there were days when I was losing the will to live. I was so sick. And if you've ever been sick, you just, you know, you don't, it's hard to think clearly when you feel horrible. And I felt horrible. I did 650 hours of chemotherapy in eight months. And so I was on death's doorway many a time. I was in the ER many a time with 104 fever, with my eyes swollen shut with an infection. And those affirmations every single day pulled me through. And step three for your affirmations is what specific actions will you take and when? And that's where the rubber meets the road, as my coach used to say, right? What are you, affirm what you're committed to, affirm why you're committed to it, and then affirm which specific actions you will take and when. Because without step three, one and two don't matter, right? It's not magically going to your life. Things don't change unless you do the things to make them change. And so for me, my, my what was the 650 hours of chemo combined with every holistic practice that I knew. I did. I took 50 supplements a day. I eat or ate a raw organic diet. I um, I did uh, ozone sauna. I did lymphatic massage. I did acupuncture. I did coffee enemas. And by the way, if you don't know what a coffee enema is, Google it. It's a little uncomfortable, <laughs> but every time I did it, I'm like, I deserve to beat this cancer. Like I'm putting in the work, right? <laughs> um, so those three steps for affirmations. You're not lying to yourself. You're not promising a magical result. You're affirming what you're committed to, why you're committed, and what you need to do to ensure that commitment becomes a reality. The V in Sabres is for visualization. Now, similar to affirmations, we've been taught visualization in a way that I think is can be ineffective. We're taught to visualize the ideal outcome, right? See yourself in the house of your dreams or with, you know, driving your Ferrari or like usually it's materialistic, right? We're taught visualize this outcome. Um, there's a problem with that. There's value in that, which I'll explain. But the problem is if you visualize an outcome as if it's a foregone conclusion over and over, you actually trick yourself into believing that it is a foregone conclusion, again, independent of your effort. A lot of people, whether it's affirmations or visualization or these other practices, the way they've been taught to us, just it's like they're selling us this woo-woo stuff that makes us feel better while we do it. So we get addicted to doing it, but it's not actually changing our lives. And so with visualization, the value in visualizing your ideal outcome, there is value. The value is the more you see it, especially if it's so far out of your comfort zone that you have trouble even imagining you can actually make it true. When you visualize it over and over, you're acclimating to that possibility. You're going, wow, at first, you know, I couldn't even imagine it, but now I've seen it so many times. I actually believe I'm seeing what it's going to look like and how it's going to feel. That is step one, and it's the least important step. The real crucial visualization aspect is to visualize yourself engaged in the necessary activity today. So every morning during your miracle morning, you visualize yourself doing the thing today, whether it's going for a run while you're training for that marathon, or eating the right foods because you're trying to lose weight, or engaging with in a loving, peaceful way so that you can create a harmonious relationship or visualize yourself picking up the phone and cold calling prospects, right? So that you can make those sales. So whatever it is, it's visualizing yourself engaged in the necessary activity while putting yourself in a optimal emotional state. So you see yourself doing the activity while putting yourself in the optimal emotional state to do it 
whether that's confidence as you pick up the phone, whether that's empathy as you connect with your spouse, whether that's playfulness as you engage with your kids, whether that's motivation as you step out onto the pavement to go for a run, whatever it is. And I'm going to give you an example right now. When I committed to run an ultra marathon, I had never run a step outside of high school PE class. Like once a year, you had to run the mile. So four years, I ran four miles in my entire life. Um, but I wanted to, when I did my miracle morning, I thought, how could I challenge myself physically, like beyond what I've ever done before. And so I, um, I committed to run a 52 mile ultra marathon and I publicly committed so that I had accountability and I would look like a jerk if I didn't do it right. Everybody knew I was doing it to raise money for charity and, uh, but I had to train. And so I hated running. So here's how I use visualization every morning. I'd spend about a minute visualizing myself crossing the finish line. And I actually mm -hmm. printed out a picture of the new or the Atlantic city marathon finish line. So I actually knew exactly what it looked like. I would see myself crossing the finish line. And what that did is it created that drive and that desire. Wow. I'm going to do it someday. I'm actually going to make that vision a reality. But the most important part where I'd spend the next few minutes was visualizing myself. I'd visualize my alarm on my phone going off at 7 AM, which was the time that I was committed to go for a run. I'd pick up the phone and turn it off. I'd visualize myself turning it off. I'd visual visualize myself going into my closet in my bedroom, getting dressed in my running clothes. I'd visualize myself walking throughout my living room, opening the front door, and here's the most important part. I'd visualize myself staring at the sidewalk. And then I would say things to myself while I visualized to get in that emotional state. I'd say, all right, this is it. I am becoming a runner. I'm going to run today and I'm going to, it's going to get easier and easier and easier every step I take. And every step I take, I am becoming more disciplined. And this running is enabling me to become the person I need to be to create everything else I want for my life. Let's go for this run. And then I'd visualize myself taking off on the run. Here is how that mental rehearsal impacts you in real time. When my alarm went off at 7 a.m., instead of doing what we all often do with activities that we don't do, uh, you know what, I'll just, I can skip today. I'll just do it tomorrow. One day won't hurt me, right? We, we talk, we justify mediocrity and talk ourselves out of it. But here's what happened. I, I, I didn't rehearse talking myself out of it. I rehearsed getting off my butt, going in my closet, getting dressed. So when the alarm on my phone went off at 7 a.m., I turned it off. I didn't even think about it. I stood up. I walked into my bedroom closet, put on my running clothes, headed through my living room, out my front door. When I opened my front door, just as I had rehearsed, I became flooded with the thoughts and the emotions looking at that sidewalk. I'm going for a run. This is going to be amazing. I'm becoming more disciplined. The person I need to be, all those things. And I went for the run. That's the power of visualization is you are mentally rehearsing yourself taking the actions that you need to take today while in an optimal emotional state so that when the time on the clock strikes the time to take the action, you are a compelled to follow through. And let me go through these last savers quickly, unless there's anything to, to share on that and then I can go through the last three. Well, I, I will just say real quickly, I think that's so interesting because that is a definitely a different take on visualization and I don't think I've heard you talk about it quite in depth, even on your podcast. So I'm going to definitely go back and listen to this and restructure my visualizations. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I keep learning more and sharing more. So yeah, you're right. I don't know if I've ever talked about it quite that way. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through the last three. The first three require a lot more explanation. The last three are relatively straightforward. E for exercise. All I'll say is this. I'm not saying you have to go to the gym in the morning, right? During your miracle morning. I'm saying that you need five to 10 minutes or not that well, yeah, really that you need if you want to be in your best at your best five to 10 minutes of physical exercise in the morning. It could be going for a walk or a jog. If it's cold outside and you, it's too cold to go for a walk or a jog, I have stairs in my house. I do laps on my stairs up, down, up, down, up, down, and I'll do it 30 times, take a break and do it again. Um, do jumping jacks, do crunches, do sit-ups, do a free yoga video on YouTube, whatever. Here's the point. You've got to wake up your lymph system and get blood and oxygen flowing through your body and through your brain. Getting that blood and oxygen to your brain increases your mental clarity. It increases your discipline and getting physical exercise in the morning increases your energy levels that benefit you all day. So even if you go to the gym in the afternoon or the evening for an hour or whatever, you'd be crazy to miss out on the benefits of that little bit of exercise first thing during your miracle morning. 
The R in Sabres is for reading. And again, it's pretty straightforward, but we're all one book away from learning what we need to learn, a single strategy or concept or philosophy to transform any area of our life. You wanna be happier? There's a book or two or hundreds of books to be happier. You wanna be healthier. You wanna improve your marriage. You wanna be a better parent. You want more money. There's a book for that and, and, and all of that. So uh, if you only read five pages a day, you're still reading an average of, that's, that's 1800 pages a year. That's nine 200 page self-help books. That means you can be, you can master the area of health, relationships, finances, fitness, right on and on and on in, I mean, you'd be a different person. Um, and last but not least is scribing and scribing is a fancy word for writing or journaling, but the, uh, the power of putting pen to paper, we all have, it's like, you know, 40 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And most of them are the same as yesterday. We keep repeating our life over and over and over again. So the idea of clarifying your thoughts in writing, it creates heightened clarity that allows you to work through your problems and challenges, come up with brilliant ideas that you can implement into your life to improve your life, your business. So what I do every day is I write down real simple, three things I'm grateful for, and then I sit with those for a few minutes and I really feel that heartfelt gratitude. And then I write down three things, the three most important things for me to get done today. Because the reality is, more often than not, we gravitate toward the easiest things on our list. I'm gonna just stay busy by checking email and doing these things that, 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 have, that are not out of my comfort zone. But they don't usually really move us forward. They just keep us spinning our wheels where we are. So every day I look at my to-do list, which is usually dozens of things. I look at my goals, I look at my to-do list for a few minutes, and I ask myself, what's the single most important thing for me to do today that will make the biggest impact in my life? And once I write that down, I ask the same question. What's the second most important thing on my list that I could do today to move me forward? And then what's the third most important thing? And if you do that every day, that's the secret to productivity, not being busy, but actually being productive and producing results that create serious you know, uh, outcomes in your life that are really, really uh, beneficial. Wow, that just like took a whole book and condensed it into about 10 minutes. So that was <laughs> awesome. We are almost out of time. So I just have a couple of more questions for you. And I really yeah. want to encourage the audience. If you have not watched the Miracle Morning movie, you must. And how I loved your book, but the movie 10x the experience. It <laughs> awesome. absolutely awesome. did. It was it was so crazy because um, a friend of mine were, and I were doing a virtual party, and so we stayed on to the very, 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 very end after you know you guys were doing your little coaching sessions and all that at the end yeah. and sharing more. But you being so vulnerable in that movie, and I mean, I cried so many times, and but then I laughed, you know, and celebrated with you. Yeah. I felt like I was right there on your journey, and so. And, and, and I do want to throw this out there too. Thank you so much for introducing me to Dr. Sean Stevenson. Amazing, mm, yeah. amazing person. So, and I yeah. love that that was in memory of him. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so kidding. what, what inspired you to move your book to a documentary movie? Yeah, it was, a, it's a real straightforward story. Um, one of my good friends, Nick Conadera is a filmmaker. And he had made a single movie. It was like a millennial comedy. And he was over at my house for dinner one night. This was 2014, I think. And he said, Hal, you, the Miracle Morning is so viral. He said, you know, people, it's word of mouth. It's just good. people, it's changing people's lives. They share it. How can I do that with my movie? And I said, look, I said, you know, no offense. I love your movie. It, it cracks me up, but it doesn't change someone's life. So when they're done watching it, they're gonna go watch another movie and they're not gonna be thinking about your movie. But the Miracle Morning is this daily practice that people, they do it for sometimes, I mean, forever. You know, it's a lifelong practice. And they're talking about it all the time because it's constantly improving their life because you can't, there's no limit to our human potential. So anyway, I said, if I were you, I would make a documentary about something that changes people's lives. And it's so funny, I am always like, I, I miss the obvious always. <laughs> so I'm brainstorming with him all these ideas. I'm like, what about, what are you passionate about? He's like helping millennials with their finances. I'm like, yeah, go find that people that, that, that you know, giving him all these ideas. And like 30 minutes later, he goes, wait a minute. What if we did a documentary about the miracle morning and all the people's lives is changing? 
And I go, I'm like, you know, face palm. And I go, duh. <laughs> yes, that's great. But I was, you know, I was busy like most people. I said, like, someday, you know, that's a, I love that idea. Like, maybe next year, you know, I, I've got my goals this year. And Nick is very persistent. He kept bugging me, bugging me, texting me. When are we doing the movie? When's the movie happening? And I kept, you know, brushing him off. And then he called me one day and he said, what's your mission with the Miracle Morning? And I knew he knew, but I humored him. I said, it's to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. And he said, what percentage of humanity reads self-help books? Mm. And, and I kind of knew where he was going, but I, I played along and I said, uh, like 1%, maybe I don't, it's, you know, it's 2%. I don't know. And he said, what percentage of humanity, at least in developed countries, you know, he said, um, watch film, watch, you know, the television screen. And I, I, I said, yeah, the, the rest, the other 99%. And um, I said, I guess we're making a movie. And, and his point was that if I wanted to reach the masses, I had to put the Miracle Morning in a form mm -hmm. that the majority uh, consume. They don't consume books, not self-help, but they consume television by, you know, you know, thousand times more. And so we started filming the movie and um, yeah, so that, that's what got us uh, to, to make it. And, and we wanted to make it diff better than the book or, or beyond the book where we not only shared the miracle morning, but you get to see the, right. You've seen it. You see these people, these ordinary people that one guy lost 90 pounds in six months. Another woman who was blind, a single mom divorced, fulfilled her dream of being a motivational speaker. She's out in Kenya. Um, another uh, a gentleman who lost his child, his son died. And then he went into a deep depression. Mm -hmm. The Miracle Morning got him over his depression. I mean, there's all these amazing stories. And then we went some of the world's most successful people and we showed how they are starting their day. And, you know, so, yeah. So anyway, so the Miracle Morning movie, um, that, that's why we created it and, and kind of uh, how it became a lot more than the book. Well, and I want to tell you, because one of the people that was on your movie, um, is also so there's two books that transformed my life and set me on my journey that I'm on today which is amazing it's one of growth it's growth mindset but it was the miracle morning which I saw on somebody's vision board that's how I found you wow of somebody wild. else's vision board and then the five second rule uh, Mel Robbins Mel, yes so yes. she I had to have Mel She's Robbins amazing. help me break the snooze habit so it was amazing and how and I am so appreciative this is I, I know my audience is just beside themselves because we talk about you on at least every other podcast you know and so they're gonna be so excited oh, cool. but I don't want to let you get away without answering our VIP questions you got well, it I'm at least you. two of the three one of them I think I shared with you was based on your book <laughs> yeah. so but I'm really right. interested to see your take on this so if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars what three things or people would you take with you I think that's an easy one because I've got a wife and two kids. So I would take Ursula, my wife, and then my son, Halston, and my uh, my daughter, Sophie, for sure. Of course. And then we'd figure the rest out. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have fun while you were there, though, because you'd have everybody right. love with you. Um, and that's so right. my second question that I typically ask, which I think you've already answered, is what is one thing do you do each morning to set your day up for success? But you wrote a whole yeah. book on that. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely the miracle morning. Yes. Actually, wait, let me answer that in one other way. Okay. Um, the other thing that I do is I spend time with my family. I wake my kids up at 6.30 a.m. to do Miracle Morning with them. From 7 to 8 a.m. is family time where I help my wife and my kids. I make uh, you know breakfast and lunch and all of that. So that's really important because the old workaholic Hal before cancer didn't do that. I went in, I hid in the cave, mm -hmm. right? I hid in my, my office. I did my Miracle Morning. All I did was my wife would say, we're, we're leaving for school. And I would kiss them goodbye real quick, go back in. Um, now I take my kids to school half of the time, uh, pick them. So yeah, so that, that is something that I do to make my, my, my life really rich and meaningful and, and be there for my family uh, and not just uh, my work. That is amazing. And I shared with you earlier that my, I referred to him as my forever man. Um, he and I yep. do our miracle morning together. And part of what we do is we also write down our gratitudes, but then we read them to each other, what we're grateful for and what our intent for the day is. So, Beautiful. and that has, yeah, That's it's amazing. been amazing. So my final question is if your life's work was being summarized in a headline, what would, what in a headline, I knew I was going to mess that one up. Uh, if your life's uh, work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Um, 
man dedicates his life to elevating the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. I love it. How do people find you? Uh, go to miraclemorning.com. That's the best spot. You can find the movie there. You can find links to buy the book there. And, uh, and last but not least, I invite everybody to join the Miracle Morning community. And that's also yes. on the homepage of miraclemorning.com. But it's a Facebook group with 295,000 members from over 100 countries that wake up every day and support each other on this uh, Miracle Morning journey that, uh, that we're all on, this journey of life. It's so amazing. Thank you so much for giving this to the world. It has been a game changer. So thank I have, you for sharing it. You together, we are elevating consciousness, Casey. So thank you so much for being an advocate and, and paying it forward. My friends call me a town crier when I find something that I like. So I'm like, have you read this book? Have you read this book? You know, so I'm the same way. Yeah. <laughs> so one last thing to say to you, Hal, besides thank you so much for your time today. You are a VIP. Thanks. Takes one to know one. <laughs> and that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.